Hello, everybody. Um, great to have you here today. Um, I've gathered a fun fact about Marco. He's from San Francisco, but he's trying to escape the terrible smoke and he has escaped to Kentucky. So you can breathe freely now for your talk. So today, Marco is going to talk to us about connectivity rules, everything around us. If you have any, have any questions for Marco, please put it in the chat and we'll answer that after the, the talk. Over to you, Marco. Thank you, Julia. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Palladino and I'm the co-founder and CTO of Kong. So today we're going to be talking about something that's very important when it comes to modern architectures and applications, and that is connectivity. You see, we're, we're entering a, a new era of software. And um, in this new era of software, we are replacing our large code bases into smaller ones that are going to be connected with each other thanks to connections. And these connections are going over a network. Now, this has significant benefits as well as significant challenges that we have to address. Uh, first and foremost, we are doing this because it's a natural evolution on, of any digital application that evolves over time. Every business, as we know, becomes digital, even more so during these very hard times. It is pretty clear that digital is the future and, and those organizations who have been lagging behind have been accelerating their efforts to digitalize uh, in order to be able to stay relevant in the future. But the thing is, as soon as we digitalize and as soon as we create any sort of digital application, sooner than later, if the application is successful, we want to be able to deploy very often. We want to be able to deploy every day or multiple times a day. We want to be able to become highly available. And to do that, we want to distribute our software across different clouds, different regions. Um, we want to be able to hire more people in a faster way. Therefore, we build teams that are going to be allocated to smaller parts of the overall application and are going to be focused on those microservices in order to contribute in a much faster way. As soon as we do any of these things, we're going to be introducing connectivity at the backbone of of our application. We're going to be connecting all of this together across multiple clouds, multiple regions, and multiple services. And connectivity effectively becomes the way that different services or different parts of our app are going to be leveraging in order to communicate with each other. In short, we're going to be increasing the number of services that we have running across the organization. Now, this has lots of benefits, right? If we can hire, uh, teams and developers that are going to be working on separate features, and each one of them are going to be communicating via an interface, and that is the API, that creates enormous benefits. As an application developer who's building an application, who's building a service, I don't need to know how another feature is being built, what is the implementation of this other feature, as long as I have an API that I can consume over the network. And the API traditionally, you know, has been HTTP, you know, back in the days, uh, we used to have SOA, then HTTP, but, but really today, we're going to be using whatever protocol better suits and better fits our use case. And so we're going to be seeing lots of gRPC, we're going to be seeing lots of Kafka for event-based microservices, we're going to be seeing all different ways that our services communicate with each other. But the most important part is that whatever protocol that we're going to be using, that request sooner than later, is going to go over a network. And by increasing the number of services, of course, we decrease over time the control and the visibility that we have across each one of these different parts, running moving parts of our application. So what we used to use back in the days in a centralized architecture, uh, which was static, was monolithic, was uh, perhaps even running on-prem, it's going to be different from what we're going to be running in this new decentralized world, which is dynamic. It's leveraging the cloud. It's built on top of the shoulders of giants. Now, when we have multiple services talking to each other, and when we deploy each one of them independently and separately, one of the most important things to realize is that all of these services are not talking to each other on function calls like in the monolithic days. In a monolith, we would build classes, we would build objects, and each one of them would communicate with each other with function calls. 
And there is this uh, assumption that the function call, once, once it's being made, it is going to be executed by the underlying runtime. So if we do have a Java virtual machine and the Java virtual machine receives a function call, it will just work. Now, when we decentralize and decouple the services into separate uh, executables or separate binaries, separate processes, we introduce something that replaces the function call and, and with something else. And that something else really is the network call. And the network, it is problematic. On one end, now that we have decoupled and distributed our application, we can iterate much faster, deploy much faster, you know, be highly available. But then on the other end, we also have to be managing the network, which before wasn't um, being used at this scale. So the network really becomes the single largest uh, variable that we have to address, not across one service, but all of them. Anything that makes a request over the network, it is going to be having to address how the network works. The network is not secure. The network is unreliable. The networks can be slow. And so we need to think about this. Now, in a monolithic world, like I said, we had function calls. So typically, if we had to you know, build the different functionalities within our application, we would build different objects, and then we would have um, a code interface that would be consumed by a function. Of course, the more decoupled and you know, and the and, and, and the and the more um, specialized our services become, um, and and the less and less this becomes viable, and that function call becomes replaced with a network call. And the network call goes outside of a pod. If you're running on Kubernetes, it goes outside of a virtual machine. If you're running on on let's say EC2, and, and it goes over this network. And now you know the network. It, it's not something that we are for the necessarily introducing for the first time with microservices. I mean, the network has always been there. Even when a monolith was talking to a database, well, that network request was very important. If this network request failed, then the database would be unreachable and the monolith would be down. The difference between then and now is that this threat it is much bigger at a much larger scale because we're going to be having more and more services moving forward. And if you do not manage that network and that connectivity across the services, then we're going to be having larger and bigger problems in the future. The network is important uh, because it allows us to do some things that perhaps in monolithic applications also we were not able to do. Uh, so for example, uh, in front of you here, I'm showing you all different concerns that we have to manage when it comes to the network. And of course, it's the encryption. Of course, it's the identity of every service. We want to be able to build a zero trust security model, which means that we're not trusting any service in the network. And every service must identify itself, even if it runs within the context of the same organization. This will increase security a lot. But you know, microservices improve security in a way when it's done right. And you may ask yourself, well, wait a second. How can microservices improve security over a monolithic app? A monolithic app has no network, so it must be more secure than microservices. Well, that's one way to think about this. Another way, it is to think that with microservices, we can apply more fine-grained rules that determine what parts of the applications are allowed to consume what other functionality that perhaps is being hosted on other services. You see, in a monolith, when we are consuming an object, anything that runs in that code base can potentially consume it as well. So if we have a function that creates an invoice, well, nothing prevents any other class or object within the monolith to also implement and consume that invoice object to create or delete invoices, for example. With, mono with microservices, we can more fine grain uh, control how we can determine the access between one functionality, one service, and another by applying traffic permission ACL, for example, that determine that this service can consume the invoice microservice, but not this other service. So in a way, we can lock it down in a much more fine-grained way, which, if done right, and that's the keyword, improves the overall security of the application. Now, like I said, connectivity goes over a network. The network must be encrypted, must be secured. We need to be able to enforce routing across all these different services. We may want to enable blue-green deployments or canary releases of our services so that we determine when we release a new product, for example, 
that the new version of the product works before we shift all of the production traffic to this new version. We want to be able to observe the traffic. In a monolithic application, if something goes wrong, we get a very nice stack trace that tells us exactly where the function has failed. So if the function doesn't work, the stack trace tells us, you know, this line failed, and that's how we can go and fix it. But in microservices, the overall requests may fail, not because it fails in one service, but because perhaps the network is unreliable. And so in flight, that connection gets lost. And so we must have end-to-end -end traces to determine what is the latency of every component to determine if the network is not working when it's supposed to be. And so the observability, the logging, the metrics, the tracing, these are all things that we have to build on top of each service in order to make sure that we are successful into a microservices transition and we can then you know, digitalize in a safe manner our applications. As well as being able to you know, improve the resiliency of our software by deploying it in, into multiple data centers. How do we perform data centers failovers becomes another question that we have to solve. And so when, when we think about when we think about monolithic application, it's not that that these concerns were not there. These concerns have have always been there. You know, every time a monolithic application makes a request to a database again, for example, uh, we either have a client library that performs some of these functions for us, so like the TLS, the encryption, the security, the discovery, or whoever is consuming the database in this example is going to be writing those more code to effectively manage this service connectivity. So the developer who's consuming the database, that developer or developers are going to be writing code to effectively log and monitor that every database request, it is successful. Now, we can imagine how if multiple teams are going to be managing the network into different applications or different services, over time, we get all sorts of complexity and, and fragmentation, even more so because each service may be built in a different uh, language, in a different framework. Each service may be running on different clouds. And, and the more we, let, we leave uh, the connectivity unattended, the more and more the application teams, instead of focusing fully on building the apps and building the service, are going to be spending some time managing the network. But because it's not their job, they're going to be doing it in a very poor way. And that creates overall fragmentation and poor implementations. If the application teams are managing the network because we are decoupling our software more and more, and we, the architects, do not give them an underlying infrastructure to run their service requests in a secure and unified way, they're going to be doing it instead of us. And because it's not their job, they're not going to be doing it right. And what happens when the network is not being managed the right way? It creates errors. It creates production problems. It hurts the business. Service connectivity becomes the backbone of any every modern application. If that service connectivity, it's not part of the underlying infrastructure that we provision to the application teams and the application teams are doing it, that's not their job. And as a result of that, we're going to be hurting the business. The connectivity must be provisioned to the application teams the same way we provision them the workload management. If an application team wants to deploy something on Kubernetes, we don't ask them to manage their own Kubernetes cluster to deploy it by themselves. We do it for them as part of the underlying infrastructure provisioning. Likewise, connectivity also must come provisioned for them so that it's already there and the application teams can focus on building products as opposed to managing the network. That's not their job. So let's take a look at service mesh, for, for example. You know, there is different connectivity use cases, right? We have connectivity at the edge, and we may be using API gateways for that. But then we have connectivity in app within the context of an application that in the meanwhile has been transitioning to microservices. So let's, let's take an example, for example, with service mesh, right? So we have a service that implements all sorts of uh, functionality to make requests to other services. 
it manages errors, it manages retries, it, it secures and encrypts the connection and so on and so forth. It logs and collects traces for these requests. So what if instead of telling, instead of having this functionality being built by the application teams, what if we don't decouple our network management functionality from the service itself and we build it in such a way that it can be reused with any service, regardless of what is the implementation of that specific service. So for example, we can uh, include it in a separate executable that uh, we can at this point, you know, port or run across, it's portable, we can run it across every environment, containers or Kubernetes or whatever that is. And uh, we're going to be pushing this component on the execution path of our requests so that every time there is a service wanting to consume another service, the request is being intercepted by this component. And this component is in charge then of actually making the request as a proxy effectively, in charge of making the request and securing, securing it, encrypting it and monitoring and so on and so forth. And, uh, and because we want to make sure that the latency between our service and this third party process, it's as low as possible. We want to run this process on the same underlying virtual machine or host or Kubernetes pod as where the service is running so that the communication between the service and this component, it is on local host. Now, because we want to have end-to-end -end security and end-to-end -end encryption, we may want to have the same component also receiving the requests on the other end. And just like that, effectively, we are introducing, introducing something that is going to be in charge of intercepting outbound requests that any service is making and then intercepting them when they, they're being received on the other end in order to enforce end-to-end -end tracing or end-to-end -end encryption or to retry the request or to route the request. Now, we don't have to build that by ourselves. For example, we can use existing proxies that implement this network management functionality for us so that we adopt these technologies instead of building them. Uh, and one of them, it's Envoy Proxy. You may have heard of Envoy Proxy. It is a very it's a very um, good technology written in, uh, in, uh, in C++. It's a proxy layer that's being adopted by all the largest organizations in the world to implement these sort of use cases. And, and we're going to be having our component, our Envoy, running across each instance of every service that we're running. It can be a virtual machine, can be a pod. Every time there is a replica of our service, we're going to be having this component intercepting requests that either are coming out or are coming in in order to make sure that the network is managed via this third party proxy and not within our services. And of course, the more services we have and the more of these proxies we're going to be having around. And this creates a little bit of a complexity into managing the architecture. If we do have lots of services, which uh, lots of proxies, um, in this case, Envoy, which run on the data plane execution path of our requests, how do we manage them all over time? So if we abstract away service connectivity from the services by having an instance of our proxy next to each service, how do we manage the proxies themselves? We don't want to redeploy the entire infrastructure every time we want to change something from the proxy. We want to be leveraging some form of dynamic configuration to make this happen. And this is why we introduce a control plane, a control plane that is, go that is going to effectively uh, enable connections between the date to the data planes um, and then push that configuration that we want to apply in a dynamic way directly to the data planes. So the control plane becomes a source of truth of our network configuration that we can push to these remote third party data planes in order to manage how we want service connectivity to work within our uh, modern applications. And, and, and just like that, for example, we have introduced, we have described what service mesh is. Service Mesh helps us deal with some of the connectivity use cases that we're going to be uh, having to fix as we transition to microservices. Instead of letting the application teams build all these service management for themselves in a fragmented way across all their services, across the entire org, we want to decouple that away from them. And we want to use a sidecar proxy, in this case, Envoy, to manage that service connectivity from one service to another. And a service here, it's not just something, you know, something that we build ourselves. A service can be anything that makes a request over the network or receives a request from the network. So for example, 
A service could be Kafka. A service could be MongoDB. We can use the following model across any service, the ones that we build and the ones that we adopt, download and use, right? And so everything that makes a request or, or receives a request from the network becomes a service. And that service is going to be making a receiving request over the network. And because of that, they're going to be running a Psycar proxy who's going to be in charge of that. We need a control plane to manage all of this. And you know, we at Kong have built a control plane that we have donated to the CNCF Foundation. So it's an open source vendor neutral control plane for service mesh, and it's called Kuma. So you can check it out on Kuma.io. And if you want to run a service mesh across multiple environments, multiple clouds on virtual machines and Kubernetes, we have done lots of work to make sure that we could provide an easy to use platform that anybody can use part of CNCF in order to build modern applications. And unlike other service meshes, this is focused not just on Kubernetes, but on virtual machines as well. And it's focused on simplicity. Simplicity really, I think it's a feature. And we put lots of effort into making sure that microservices and service meshes in particular um, are not hard to use like they've been up until now, but it could be easy to use. So I really suggest checking it out, um, it is, uh, and it supports Envoy proxy natively. Now, like I said, if you take a step back, we're going to be dealing with connectivity all around us. There's going to be more and more connectivity powering the backbone of our uh, modern applications, and that's inevitable. So the question is, how are we going to be addressing this connectivity across different architectures? How are we going to be addressing this connectivity across all of our applications? We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to provide one solution that anybody, any application team can leverage out of the box. So in a way, in a way, we want to abstract away service connectivity the same way we abstract away data center operations using Kubernetes, right? We, we want to make that out of the box. We want to make that a uh, part of the underlying infrastructure. And we want to do that not just with microservices, but with anything that makes or receives requests over the network. We saw, we saw today that monolithic applications also are making requests, if anything, to a database. And then the more services we have and the more connections we're going to be having. So what is the underlying infrastructure we're putting in place to make sure that we can manage our service connectivity in an organized way? API gateways and service meshes are part of the same connectivity uh, problem. Uh, API gateways are going to be used, for example, when we want to enable connections either at the edge, so we want to have external clients or external developers consuming our services, and we want to make sure that they can enter our uh, infrastructure. A service mesh, for example, it's not applicable at the edge. In order to run a service mesh, we must have a sidecar proxy that connects to a control plane, but if the service that the client is being built externally to the organization, we, we cannot force um, a third party developer to use a sidecar. And even if we could, we don't want their sidecar to talk to our control plane. So at the edge, for example, the connectivity problem has to be fixed in another way. It cannot be a service mesh, it must be an API gateway. When we have different teams and or different applications, even internally wanting to communicate with each other, we can still use an API gateway to enforce user governance policies and, and onboarding policies to determine how a team is going to be using a subset of our APIs. But then within the context of an application, as we decouple those applications in more and more different services, we want to make sure that the connectivity within the app is also taken care of. And that is when we can use a service mesh for that. So, you know, API gateway and service mesh effectively are, par are part of the same puzzle of the same connectivity use case, but they address different, different um, deployments of that connectivity. The gateway, every time we want to enable third parties to consume at the edge, or we want to enable different teams and different applications to talk to each other, and the service mesh within the context of an application inside of an app to connect all the dependencies and all the services that that one specific app may be deploying. As a matter of fact, we may want to run more than one service mesh, perhaps one per application, in order to reduce the team coordination that's required to manage a service mesh at scale. That's one. That's why one of the features that Kuma implements since day one, it's the ability of being able to create multiple service meshes from one control plane, as opposed to having to deploy a new control plane or a new deployment of service mesh for each mesh that we want to create. 
And, and, and this is how these two systems would work together effectively in order to provide this end-to-end -end full stack connectivity abstraction that, that uh, allows us to connect all the software and all the services together without having to reinvent this um, in our application teams. Effectively, you know, we're going to be using, let's say, Docker to package our software in a standardized way. We're going to be using, for example, orchestration platforms like Kubernetes to abstract away data centers in a standardized way. And then we're going to be using uh, a strong integration between a gateway and a service mesh together in order to provide a standardized way to manage our service connectivity. And this is really the bread and butter of what you know Kong does uh, when it comes to the open source technologies that we contribute to. The Kong gateway for, for API gateway and Kuma with the rest of the broader community, of course, when it comes to service mesh. So today we looked at uh, three things. We looked at uh, this new era of software made of connections. Uh, these connections are always and only going to be increasing moving forward. And we looked at patterns like service mesh to learn how we can address some of these connectivity challenges, as well as the integration between service mesh and API Gateway. So thank you so much. And uh, when it comes to service mesh, if you want to take a look at the CNCF Kuma project, you can go on Kuma.io slash uh, And you know, if, if you're interested in a full stack end-to-end -end platform for Gateway and Mesh, you can, of course, check out kongHQ.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marco. That was really good insight, really good talks. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put it into the chat and we can talk about that now. Yeah, let me pull up my chat real quick. So Marco, you, you, you emphasize a lot on how important the network is um, what would your number one advice you would give to people when they try to move away from monolith type architecture into a more microservice um, architecture? What, what do you think is the number one most important thing? You, you see, when I, there, there is a few, a few things to, a few, no, a few points to this answer. Uh, one of the best advice I could give is to implement this transition in a gradual way. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, and I, in the past, did this mistake myself. You know, when we try to transition to microservices, we paint this picture of the world where everything is uh, decoupled and, and very small, very small units of executions. And, and we are going to be, we're going to be effectively decoupling everything in these very small components. And, and one of the biggest learnings is they don't have to be small at first. That can be small-ish. So the, the transformation can be gradual because we're always going to be having time in the future to make them smaller if they become a blocker to the business. So making them too small too early may, may not prepare us to better handle this new scale that we have. Whereas if we if approach the transition from a gradual way and we go to you know uh, mini services, if you wish, prior to going to microservices, as we make that transition, we can build the underlying platform and tooling that will give us more confidence that we can then address all these connectivity challenges at a larger scale. There is always time to make our services smaller, but once they're small, there is lots, in, lots of infrastructure that goes with it. So there is no reason to rush it unless we really, really need to do it. That's great advice. Um, maybe we have one more. Um, what is do you think of any downside of the sidecar pattern? Yeah, so sidecars, um, the, the reason why the industry has moved to sidecars when it comes to service mesh, it, it is primarily for the following reason. Uh, we're going to be assigning an identity to every replica of our services, not just one identity that all the replicas are sharing for for the service. So let's say that I have a backend and the backend runs on 10 different pods or virtual machines. Each one of them, it is going to be providing a certificate and an identity so that we can, in a more fine-grained way, uh, identify who, what are the services running in the network and in a more fine-grained way, determine service mesh policies to one replica or another based on health checking properties and so on. The downside of sidecars is that we're going to be running the sidecar on 
this is the benefit and the downside. The downside mm -hmm. it is that we're going to be having lots of sidecars running. And so if the sidecar is not lightweight, if the sidecar is not polished, if the, if the sidecar does not pay attention to the memory and CPU consumption, well, that sidecar, it is going to be taking away resources that we could be using for running our applications instead. So that's why Envoy Proxy, it, it has been accepted um, from the industry as the de facto technology for sidecar pr uh, proxy technology, because it, it is quite small, quite lightweight, it, it is quite fast. It doesn't add too much downside when running one of these instances alongside every replica of our services. But of course, the, the, the resource consumption, it is, it is something to be looking at. Yeah. Now, if the resource consumption is low enough, but if benefits are higher enough, that doesn't matter, right? And so this is the equilibrium that Envoy is, uh, is, is, uh, is reaching in the industry. That's, that's the, the balance that we have to take, I guess. Well, that's all the, all the time we have, unfortunately. Um, thank you very much, Michael. That was really great presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.